Welcome to SNC's podcast series, SNC Critical Insights. I'm Sophie Vandergriff, Special Counsel in SNC's Litigation Group, where my practice focuses on antitrust issues. I'm also an alum of the FTC's Bureau of Competition. On today's podcast, we're going to examine and discuss the implications of the Ninth Circuit's recent decision released just last week in the FTC's suit against Qualcomm over its patent licensing program. The opinion overturned the district court's ruling for the FTC and handed Qualcomm a resounding victory. Joining me today is Garrett Beeney, the co-head of the firm's Intellectual Property and Technology Group. Garrett is a leading practitioner in the areas of intellectual property and licensing, and he may have some insights about Qualcomm, having obtained a $960 million judgment against Qualcomm related to its licensing practices a few years ago for our client, BlackBerry. To set the stage, I'm going to provide a quick overview of the Ninth Circuit's decision. Then we'll talk through some of the court's key holdings. In closing, we'll offer some thoughts about the decision's implications for patent holders, companies doing business with patent holders, and dynamic technology markets in general. So we'll kick off with that. Qualcomm develops, manufactures, and supplies semiconductor devices known as modem chips. These are used in cell phone handsets. Original equipment manufacturers or OEMs, such as cell phone manufacturers, must use modem chips in their cellular devices to enable them to communicate across cell networks pursuant to standardized technologies such as 4G. Qualcomm holds standard essential patents, or SEPs, covering widely implemented cellular standards and is a member of two standard setting organizations, or SSOs, in case you haven't had enough alphabet soup yet, that are relevant to the case and like other SSOs, require members to license their SEPs on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, which we'll refer to as FRAND commitments. In 2017, the FTC sued Qualcomm. The FTC alleged that Qualcomm was violating the antitrust laws by, among other things, refusing to license its SEPs to competing chip suppliers and instead only licensing to OEMs in violation of its FRAND commitments. In addition, the FTC took issue with Qualcomm's no license, no chips policy, under which Qualcomm will not supply chips to an OEM unless it pays a royalty to Qualcomm for all of its device sales, regardless of whether the devices use Qualcomm chips or another brand. The FTC also alleged that Qualcomm had used the threat of cutting off access to its chips to extract onerous patent licensing terms from OEMs, including unreasonably high royalties for cell phone handset devices. In 2019, the district court ruled in favor of the FTC, finding that Qualcomm had violated the antitrust laws. The district court issued a permanent worldwide injunction barring several of the business practices that are central to Qualcomm's patent licensing program. On review, the Ninth Circuit considered three key questions. First, whether Qualcomm had an antitrust duty to deal with rival chip manufacturers by providing them a license. Second, whether certain of Qualcomm's business practices, including its no license, no chip policy to OEMs, were unlawfully anti-competitive. And third, whether the district court's injunction was appropriate. Ultimately, the Ninth Circuit held that Qualcomm did not have an antitrust duty to deal with its competitors, that its business practices were not unlawfully anti-competitive, and that the injunction was not warranted. With that very brief background in mind, Jared, could you talk us through the nuances of the Ninth Circuit's ruling with respect to two important issues grounded in IP law, uh, and that is the rate at which SEPs are valued in license agreements and the obligation under the antitrust laws to license at the chip level? Thank you, Sophie. Those were certainly two of the most significant aspects of the court's decision as it relates to intellectual property law. The district court found that Qualcomm's royalty rate between 3 and 5% of the handset price, depending upon the technologies that the handset implemented uh, for its patent license for any chip used by OEMs was unreasonably high, and as a result constituted a substantial anti-competitive chip access surcharge that, according to Judge Coe, quote, excluded competitors from the marketplace and thereby harmed competition in general, quote. Judge Coe adopted an argument that has been made by some 
that royalties under patent law must be based on the value of the smallest sellable patent practicing unit, something that uh, patent lawyers have started to talk about in the nomenclature as SSPPU. Here, that would be the chip, not the handset. Just by way of brief background, a particular patent may read on a chip, uh, it may read on a board, it may read on a component that the board is incorporated into, and it may read on the finished product. The debate that uh, was raging uh, until the Ninth Circuit decision was whether reasonable royalties had to be based on the smallest sellable patent practicing unit, again, here the chip, not the uh, handset. The Ninth Circuit characterized the district court's theory as Qualtem's royalty rate was unreasonably high as based on a percentage of the handset, not on the chip. And thus the rate was anti-competitive because it unreasonably raised costs to OEMs, who then passed along the extra cost of the royalty based on the handset value to consumers who would then invest less in other handset features. The Ninth Circuit found that this failed to state a cogent theory of anti-competitive harm. In specifically addressing this SSPPU issue, the Ninth Circuit first addressed the district court's determination that rates must be based on the smallest sellable unit, finding that that conclusion misinterpreted federal circuit law, both regarding the patent rule of reasonable royalty apportionment and the SSPPU doctrine. Again, by way of background, over the years, the Federal Circuit has struggled with determining how you go about establishing what the patent laws provide for patent infringement, which is either lost profits or pertinent here, a reasonable royalty. Over the years, the Federal Circuit has determined that you'd establish a reasonable royalty based on the proportionate value that the patenting technology lends to the product. That's been referred to as the proportionality doctrine uh, in patent royalty determination. And the debate that the Ninth Circuit weighed in on was whether that proportionality doctrine requires that the value of the patent be based on its value to the smallest sellable patent practicing unit. The Ninth Circuit rejected the notion that royalties are anti-competitive in the antitrust sense simply because they may be unreasonable under a patent law or, for that matter, FRAND analysis. The Federal Circuit has addressed the SSPPU argument several times, and those decisions were interpreted by the Ninth Circuit as not establishing any per se rule that proportionality requires basing a royalty on the value of the SSPPU. The Ninth Circuit's decision also establishes that royalty rate determinations, and particularly the determination of a FRAND rate, are issues that sound in contract law, not antitrust law. Unlike other jurisdictions around the world, the United States typically views the FRAN commitment to a standard setting organization as a contract between the patent owner and the organization to which implementers are third party beneficiaries. The court declined to adopt a theory of antitrust liability that would presume anti-competitive conduct any time a company could not prove that the, quote, fair value, quote, of its standard essential patent portfolio corresponds to what the market is willing to pay for those standard essential patents and royalty rates. Like the antitrust division, which opposed the FTC's position, the court's conclusions generally suggested that breach of FRAND issues are contract issues between private parties and become antitrust issues only in the narrowest of circumstances such as in the Third Circuit Broadcom case, which found antitrust liability based on a fraudulent misrepresentation to the standard setting organization at issue. Apart from the SSPPU FRAND issue, the Ninth Circuit decision is also important because it addressed a bit of a raging debate as to whether those who have entered into FRAND undertakings with standard setting organizations require the patent owner to license at every step of the distribution chain. Again, as I noted earlier, a patent may read on a chip, a board, a component, or the finished product. And there has been some debate as to whether the FRAND commitment requires the patent owner to license the chip manufacturer. Here, the Ninth Circuit addressed that issue and found that it was not an antitrust question as to whether patent owners must license at the chip level. The court explicitly did not decide whether a matter of the FRAND contract a license must be offered to all. We were pleased to have authored an amicus brief on this point, which the Ninth Circuit quoted several times for the proposition 
that licensing only at the finished product level and not everywhere in the product distribution chain for multiple practical reasons, as well as the patent exhaustion doctrine, was both typical and reasonable. As the court stated, quote, there are good reasons for SCP owners to structure their licensing programs to license end user products, quote. Refusal to license chip makers did not, as Joe Chico had found, deter entry into the chip making market or raise costs in a way that offended antitrust laws. As a side note, the court's refusal to force licensing at the chip level rather than at the finished product level based on antitrust law may ease concerns that patent exhaustion considerations could be used to limit SCP licensors' ability to maximize profit if licensors were required to license at the chip level. Although outside the scope of this discussion, just a very brief bit of background on the exhaustion doctrine, the reason it plays into this question of where in the product distribution chain one must license is because depending upon the nature of the claims in the patent, the nature of the invention, when a patent owner offers a chip a license and the chip becomes licensed, those patent rights may be exhausted in other components and indeed in the end product. So that once a chip is licensed, if required to be licensed, the patent owner may not then be able to license the finished product. Sophie, this case has generated a lot of attention over the last few years, in part because it sits at the intersection of patent and antitrust law and tests the boundaries of what the antitrust laws reach. What does the Ninth Circuit tell us about that debate? Thanks, Garrett. Through the antitrust lens, I think it's certainly fair to say that this case has been a bit unorthodox particularly in the way that it has showcased a highly visible clash between U.S. antitrust agencies about the appropriate scope of their role. As a general matter, the FTC and the DOJ have a close working relationship, and they are careful not to publicly air any disagreements that they may have with one another. But that norm was upended here when DOJ filed a statement arguing that any remedy in the case could threaten the United States' standing and innovation in the cellular technology market and in doing so, raise national security concerns. This is actually part of a a larger trend of DOJ filing statements of interest in private litigation over FRAND, generally taking the position that FRAND breaches alone do not constitute antitrust violations. And in fact, before the ink was dry on the Ninth Circuit Qualcomm decision, the DOJ submitted that decision for exactly this proposition in a case in the District of Delaware challenging interdigital's licensing practices. At least for now, the Ninth Circuit opinion vindicates the DOJ's position. But putting aside the interagency conflict, I think it's fair to read this decision as broadly supporting the idea that allegedly anti-competitive behavior by patent holders acting unilaterally generally should not be policed using antitrust tools. And the court's decision also reinforces the narrowness of the Aspen skiing duty to deal doctrine And as you discussed a few moments ago, Garrett, it rejects the notion that the breach of FRAN commitments in themselves might constitute anti-competitive conduct in violation of the Sherman Act. The court certainly did leave open the possibility that an SCP holder's FRAN commitments might obligate it to deal with its rivals, but it ascribed this issue to the realm of contract and patent law, kind of telling antitrust to butt out. So, Garrett, what do you see as the decision's most important implications for patent holders and those that do business with them? Sophie, I I think you said it exactly right. The Qualcomm licensing program was seen by many as ripe for an antitrust challenge. It had been challenged here and there over the years, but I think because of Qualcomm's market power in the chip market, where so many cell phone manufacturers depend on the Qualcomm chips, people had been reluctant to challenge the program. But you had a big player in the standard-setting organizations establishing industry standards for connectivity. You had a company holding what it claims to be thousands of standard essential patents on those interconnectivity standards. And you had a company enjoying a dominant position in chip sales and charging what many thought was, to say the least, a robust royalty rate. Some may feel that if that was not enough, It's hard to imagine any unilateral licensing program constituting a violation under Section 2. But more in the details, I think the decision is not just important because it rejects that a royalty must be based per se on the small assailable patent practicing unit as a matter of antitrust law, but because the court clearly understood and specifically said 
that there were very good reasons for a patent owner to license only at the finished product level. I suspect patent owners may very well cite the opinion for that proposition uh, almost more than any others. Also significantly, because the court vacated Judge Koh's decision, the only final judgment I'm aware that addresses whether FRAND, even as a contractual matter, requires chip licensing said, no, it does not. And that's a decision out of a district court in Texas. If other jurisdictions start going the other way, and there's litigation in Germany, for example, in which the German antitrust authorities have suggested that the court in Germany refer this issue, whether a friend requires chip licensing to the European Court of Justice, it may mean that a lot of SEP litigation comes to the United States that might otherwise have been filed elsewhere, if indeed these other jurisdictions find a duty to license at the chip level. We clearly are not headed in that direction. Finally, the Ninth Circuit reiterated what I believe this Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit already has said. There's no per se requirement to base a royalty rate on the smallest sellable patent practicing unit. The key issue, as we discussed earlier for the Federal Circuit, is proportionality. The royalty rate must bear a relationship to the value of the patent technology to the accused product, but that can be expressed in multiple ways and in different formulas, including based on the finished product. Sophie, any other big picture takeaways that we should highlight before wrapping up? Thanks, Garrett. I would just add that apart from SEP licensing issues, the opinion says in fairly strong terms that courts should exercise real caution when ascribing antitrust liability to conduct that occurs in a dynamic, rapidly evolving market a characterization that will apply to a broad range of existing and emerging technology markets. This certainly isn't a new concept, but it is relevant emphasis nonetheless. I think we'll see antitrust defendants use this language as a shield, and it seems inevitable that the agencies and private plaintiffs alike are going to have to contend with this going forward. And that brings us to the end of our conversation today. Thank you for listening to SNC Critical Insights. For more information about our practice or to read our August 12th memo, which provides a more in-depth analysis of the Qualcomm decision, please visit us on the web at www.cellcrom.com. Mm-hmm.